let's talk about my spec series of 2019. Hello, my name is Alex Does F1 Stuff and welcome to a slightly different video. This is technically a random F1 episode, I suppose, but it's going to be discussing the maths and the algorithms behind my 2019 spec series video. So if you have not seen that video, I'll pop a little card to it in the corner. Please go and see that. I worked super, super hard on it. And also big thanks to Racing Statistics once again, who provided some awesome, awesome animations for that video. But today is going to be explaining the maths behind the algorithms. Now, there were a lot that went behind it, a total of seven different versions. If you want to skip straight to version seven, the version that was used in the video and you don't really care about the previous versions and how I got there, then please skip to the time on screen now. But this video is basically going to be sort of a chronological look at how I went about creating version seven as each version led on to each other. Now, this story actually starts with a comment left by Philip. Now, he's been the inspiration for a few of my statistical videos as well. And he posed this question. Is there any way to roughly determine who would be better in the same car? I know it sounds almost impossible, but isn't that what statistics helps to do? It is 100% what it helps to do. And honestly, I thought it was a bit tough as well. He suggested that I take... Uh, the qualifying differentials, so say Verstappen was half a second behind Hamilton in qualifying, over a 50 lap race we can assume that Verstappen would be half a second slower in the race, so therefore there'd be a 25 second gap. And then in that particular arbitrary race, if Verstappen turned out to be over 25 seconds behind uh, Lewis, it would be a Hamilton victory, but if Verstappen was within 25 seconds, it would be a Verstappen victory. And following that sort of idea, I came up with version number one of this algorithm. Now we need to start with a table that looks a little something like this. So this is the table of lap times for each driver in Australia, round number one of the 2019 season. Just a quick note uh, for people wondering, lap one is excluded because I didn't have an automatic way of inputting the lap times. I had to manually do it for the first couple of races until I found a neat little website uh, which actually listed all of the lap times that I could just copy and paste over into my Excel page. And because the way that F1 do their timing sheets, they put the actual physical time rather than the lap time for lap number one, I just didn't include it. So that's why lap, uh, why my table starts on lap number two. But for version seven, I managed to correct it as I found this website that listed all of the information I needed. So the first thing I needed to do with this table is actually exclude everybody that failed to finish. So that was Grosjean, Ricardo, and Sainz. As unfortunately, I am not able to accurately predict and uh, forecast exactly what their lap times are going to be. So I can't really put them in. So if anyone was DNF'd in the original 2019 season's races, they had to stay DNF'd in my spec series video. And then actually the second thing that I had to do as well, if we look at the bottom portion of the race, we see that people finish on different laps. So I actually stop counting at the person that's done the least amount of laps. In this case, Kubica. He ended on lap 55. So I end up deleting, or lap 54 even. So I end up deleting the bottom four laps of racing. And that is just so everybody finishes on the same lap. So there's no issue with people being lapped, I just exclude the data as again, I cannot accurately project forward someone's lap times. I can't really do it with averages because it's just, it gets a bit messy. It's easy to just delete a couple of laps and end it on the driver before the, the driver, like Kibitza, the driver that's done the least amount of laps. It's just a lot easier to do it that way. And then everyone ends at the same period of time. So there's no issue with people being lapped, which means everybody can be included once the times are adjusted. So now we have a table that looks something like this. This is basically the pro forma for every single round. These are everyone's proper 2019 lap times, not adjusted by anything. And then I made a table that looks a little bit like this. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what the order is, as I made this table very long ago, as it doesn't go in, in gap order. But this table represents the gap to the pole sitter at the end of qualifying. So this isn't the gap between each driver's personal best lap times, this is the gap at the end of qualifying. So whenever you go to the F1 website and you go to a particular race and you click qualifying, you have one time for each driver in Q1, one time for Q2, one time for Q3. It is those gaps between those times. It is not each driver's personal best, there is a small difference. 
And so with this table, I then subtracted each of these values for each driver from their overall lap times in the table previous, and I ended up creating something that looked a bit like this. This was version number one and the output of version one, a Gasly victory from Stroll, Kubica, Hülkenberg, Kvyat, Verstappen, Raikkonen, Magnussen, Bottas, Perez are the top 10. Now at first you could be thinking that seems actually quite fair, but then when you start thinking about it, it's not. So if I just move on into a little pros and cons section, the pros for this one is it is extremely straightforward. It is as straightforward as could be. I've only got to do one set of calculations to get the qualifying gaps, and then I've got to do one other set of uh, calculations in order to work out the new lap times. So it's really not that difficult. It's very, 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 very straightforward compared to all the other versions in here. And it also deals with pit stops and things like that. So not 100%, like safety cars and things, but definitely the pit stops, it all deals with that as it's just one value that changes every single lap time. However, the cons, the benchmark loses out intra-team. Intra-team, inter-team, I wasn't 100% sure which word to use, but basically if you have two teammates, one of them is the benchmark, for example, Hamilton in Australia, and then you have Valtteri Bottas in the same car, he's actually gaining time on Lewis Hamilton. Now that's not 100% fair because that's not what I'm aiming to do. I'm aiming to extract the potential of the car, not the advantage of the driver. And exactly like I said in point number two of the cons, it makes the drivers equal, not the teams. So I went back to the drawing board and I came up with version number two. Now version number two uses exactly the same lap, date, lap time sheet page thingy that I made just before version number one, excluding all the people that DNF'd and chopping off the last couple of times until the person that's completed the least amount of laps has finished the race. However, the difference with version number two is we use a table with deltas that looks a little bit like this. Now this is the team's average lap time, average competitive lap time. So what do I mean by average competitive lap time? So when F1 actually upload all of their information and all of their timing sheets onto the FIA website and into the FIA archives, they upload, uh, I can't remember exactly what document it is, but there's a sheet full of every single qualifying lap that the drivers do. Out laps, slow laps, quick laps, everything like that. It highlights their personal best in green and then the fastest of the session in purple. And then what I've done to create the table for version number two is to take both drivers from the same team's competitive lap times, anything that was technically a push lap or within two seconds of a push lap, then average them out across the two drivers to come up with their team's specific lap time. And this is the table that came from that Mercedes beating Ferrari, beating Haas, beating Red Bull, etc, etc, etc. And then we simply apply this delta instead to the original table, and then we end up with something that looks a bit like this, which is completely and utterly different. And in very many respects, actually worse than version number one. So we've got Max Verstappen leading George Russell by 30 seconds, then Valtteri Bottas P3, Gasly P4, then Kvyat, Stroll, the two Ferraris, Raikkonen, Hamilton, Hülkenberg, Magnussen, etc, etc, etc. But if I just go to the pros and cons, so the first pro is it is very good. It focuses on the car, not the driver. This was the first version that actually isolated the car's performance to some degree. Not very well, but it did isolate the car's advantage. However, the cons, uh, yeah, there are a lot. Uh, the teammate with a large delta is massively benefited. And then it is also not the true car performance. So what do I mean by the teammate with a large delta massively benefits? So if we take Red Bull and Max Verstappen and Pierre Gasly, for example, the delta in the table for version two for Red Bull to Mercedes was one second. And that is because I'm taking the average from both drivers, Pierre Gasly and Max Verstappen. Now, those two drivers' pace differentials in qualifying was enormous. It was big. One driver was super quick, Max Verstappen. One driver was not very quick, Pierre Gasly. And that pulled Red Bull's advantage down. And if we go back to the very first table, you see that Max Verstappen is only a few tenths behind the benchmark. Whereas in the second table for version two, he ends up gaining a second per lap, which is wrong. And that's why he won by 30 seconds. And that's what I mean by the teammates with the large 
Delta massively benefits. And then point number two, not the true car performance, I sort of touched on that when I spoke about the pros, is because it takes the advantage or the average from both drivers, it's not 100% the potential of the car. It's not the true potential of it. So back to the drawing board. So I went back to the drawing board and came up with version number three. Now, the two tables that are coming up here, the one on the left is version number three, and the one on the right is from version number one. So version number three created a driver's average competitive lap time instead. It was a way of me reducing the gaps to the benchmark. So people weren't gaining as much from the raw qualifying gaps it closed them down quite significantly. It's very, very similar to version number one, as you can see from the, from the tables. Bottas actually gains a bit more in terms of the average competitive lap time, but Verstappen comes down, the Ferraris come down, the Haas come down, Renaults, and then all the way down to the Williams as well. Pretty much everybody comes down, which is exactly what I wanted. But again, you can already see where the pros and cons are going to come. But if we just pull up the results for this one, we see it is exceptionally similar to version number one, except Stroll comes out with a victory from Pierre Gasly, Valtteri Bottas, Max Verstappen, and Robert Kubica all the way down to the retirees. And so what are the pros and cons for this one? Pros, it deals with pit stops and mistakes, etc., exactly like version number one. And slower drivers don't gain as much. This was the main, main benefit of version number three. The slower drivers didn't gain as much. So you're not having Robert Kubica being five seconds behind Lewis Hamilton in the overall qualifying positions and therefore gaining five seconds per lap in the race. He's now only gaining closer to four when you take the average competitive lap times, which is ideal. However, the cons, the benchmark still loses out into team. You can see I've changed between inter and intra. I've got a bit confused. But then it also still focuses on the driver performance, not the car. I've sort of gone backwards. I've taken maybe two steps forward and one step backwards with it. So I've, I've progressed a little bit. I've enhanced it. But I've also come backwards because now I've come away from focusing on the car. And it's now back to focusing on the driver. Now, at this point, I was starting to get a little bit frustrated as it was taking a long time to come up with these ideas. Like, it really, really does take some time to actually think about this, apply it as well, and then realize, oh, bugger, that's wrong. And then I've got to delete all of that work that I've just done because I 100% suffer from uh, this stupid thing where I try, where I create one method. I then run that method through everything. I create all of the tables, I take all the screenshots, I record clips, I do everything, I do all this work, and then I change it. And therefore, all of that work I've just done, I've got to delete. And then once I've got this new idea, I go, oh my god, yes, it works. I then run it through everything again, create the tables, create the clips, create the recordings, everything like that. And then I go, oh no, I want to change it again. Delete it all again. And I did that for five or six races. Every time I then had to delete stuff, it was five or six races worth of stuff I was deleting. And that was like a couple of days worth of work that's just poof, down the drain. That was my biggest problem with this project. So I went back to the drawing board and I came up with version number four. However, I cannot take full credibility for this version at all. I've got to give a shout out to the F1 show and Tynus as well, as he helped me with this one also, so I gave him some of the uh, work that I was previously doing from versions 1, 2, and 3, and then he suggested, why don't I take the team's fastest lap time in qualifying? Regardless of which driver it comes from, doesn't matter. The team's fastest lap time. Then, regardless of what the drivers have done, you will have a pace delta between the fastest team's car. Then I won't have any issues from version number 2, I won't have any issues from version number 3 or version number 1. And so that is exactly what I did. I then had a table for Australia that looked a little bit like this. Mercedes leading with an 80.8 or 486, seven tenths ahead of Ferrari, eight tenths ahead of Red Bull, Haas, McLaren, Alfa Romeo, Toro Rosso, Racing Point, Renault, Williams. And it came up with a table that looked a bit like this, which is extremely, extremely similar to the actual outcome from version number seven. So it was a Hulkenberg victory from Lance Stroll, from Danny Kvyat, Max Verstappen, Raikkonen, Bottas, Russell, Magnussen, Perez, and Leclerc. Which is all well and good. And I thought this was perfect. This is going to work. 
However, there is a big con that I bumped into. So let's just go to the pros and cons section. So pros, it isolates the exact pace differential between the cars. This is what I've been trying to do for the first three versions. This is the true pace differential of the car. The raw qualifying pace when everything is turned up to max, every driver is pushing as hard as they can. This is the difference between the cars. This is what I've been aiming for. However, the cons, the safety car issue, I will explain this later as I didn't realize it was an issue until slightly later on. And then the difference between qualifying pace and race pace. This was what really threw version four off, unfortunately. It was working so, so well because it really was, it was the true qualifying pace. Like I explained before, it was the outright pace differential between every single car. This is what I've been aiming for, except it fell apart because there is such a vast difference between qualifying pace and race pace. So let's just take a little look at what that difference in qualifying pace and race pace is. So the table on the left is the qualifying pace for Spain. Spain is the first race which caused me a lot of grief with version number four. So we've got Mercedes eight tenths faster than Ferrari's fastest time in P2, nine tenths faster than Red Bull, then Haas, Toro Rosso, Renault, McLaren, Alfa Romeo, Racing Point and Williams. And then we have the race pace. Now this race pace table is calculated by the average competitive race time lap. So I think it was about everything under 89 seconds I did an average of to get this average here. And you can see quite clearly that there is a big, big issue. Red Bull is now P2 and the gap to Mercedes is only two tenths of a second, not eight tenths. So in qualifying, and this delta that I was using for version number four, I was applying an eight tenth delta to the race pace where they're only actually two tenths faster. That is Mercedes, the benchmark, is only two tenths faster. I'm applying a delta to all the other teams that is eight tenths. So in actuality, they're gaining an extra six tenths. The teams behind are benefiting an extra six tenths a lap. And if we just pull up the results from the qualifying table, we end up with something that looks a bit like this. Perez, Raikkonen, Giovinazzi, Russell, Sainz, Kubica, etc, etc, etc. And you have the Mercedes pair miles at the bottom in P17 and P18. 42 seconds behind the Red Bull and then two minutes behind the race leader. Whereas if we look at just the race pace, the table on the right, we end up with this order. They are much, much closer to the back of the pack, but they are still 100 seconds off of the race lead. Now, the issue with that second table in Spain, based off of the race pace, is the safety car issue. I will explain the safety car issue before version number seven, but we move on in to version number five. At this point, it's been a couple of weeks and I'm starting to get a little bit frustrated, but I now realize that I need to have a combination and an amalgamation of race pace and qualifying pace. Exactly what the, the combination of the two are, it doesn't really matter too much. I mean, yes, it will change the results, but as long as I have a combination of the two, it should be better. I need a combination of the two. So why do I need a combination of the two? Well, qualifying pace is the true pace differential of the car. That is what I'm isolating. Whereas race pace, I can't directly apply qualifying pace to it because there is such a vast difference in only a couple of races, not all of them, but there is a difference. So I have to take the majority of race pace and then I have to apply it to a minority of qualifying pace to try and balance out the overall differential. So what I've done for version number five is create a table that looks a little bit like this. This is again for Spain's data. So this table here takes 75% of the race pace value and it adds it to 25% of the qualifying value. So you can see it's sort of a halfway house between the two, which is ideal. It combines them, which is exactly what I want. And we end up with a table that looks a little bit like this. The two Renaults come out on top ahead of Perez, Russell, Raikkonen, Kubica, Giovinazzi, but I still have the same issue the top teams are all the way at the back. 
And so the pros and cons for this version. Pros, it combines both qualifying and race pace. That is ideal, that is exactly what I want. I want a combination of the two because qualifying pace, like I've said, is the raw potential and the raw difference between each car as fast as they can go, but I have to convert it to race pace because there is such a vast difference. However, the cons is the safety car issue. This set me back so much time. This, I couldn't get around this issue. I really, really couldn't. At first, I didn't even know it was an issue. This is why it kept on bugging me so much. This is why I was getting so frustrated with this project, is I didn't even know it was an issue until version number six, until after version number six even. So what exactly is the safety car issue? Let's take a look. So this is the lap sheet for Spain. All 65 laps, I've excluded the people that DNF'd and I've chopped off all the excess times and we finished at the end of Kubica's race. Now, it's not particularly clear, but I will zoom in onto this section of the safety car. We pull up this table here, laps 47 to laps 52. 47 was where Lewis Hamilton caught the safety car up, and then laps 52 was when he left the safety car behind. And I'm sure some of you can already see the issue already. I will just do a small little like pan across on, on my editor to zoom in on this issue as well, so people can see it. But then if I just pull up the averages, of these six laps, this is where my issue lies. That people under the safety car, behind the top couple of teams, the top couple of races, mainly the lapped cars, when the lapped cars are able to overtake the safety car, the first few, when the lapped cars are able to overtake the safety car, the first few people on the lead lap have to stay behind and trundle at around about a two minute, two minute 20 lap time. Whereas the cars that get to unlap themselves only get held up behind the safety car for one or two laps. And then for the remainder, they're pounding round at pretty much near enough race pace. So per lap, they're gaining about 20, 30 seconds, which is the issue. This is the safety car issue. And this is what took me so long to overcome. And the issue and the, the resolution that I have for the safety car issue is to ignore it. Ignore it is exactly what I did for the moment, but the ultimate resolution is I have to exclude every single safety car lap. I cannot include them in the races. It's a shame because I wanted to, because I wanted to keep it as true to the 2019 season as possible. I really didn't want to have to create fictional laps, which is why I deleted the laps of the, of the front runners, because I didn't want to project forwards. I didn't want to project forwards DNF people. I wanted to keep the season as true as possible which is why I tried so hard to, to come up with a way around it. And by coming up with a way around it, I just ignored it and pretend it didn't happen. So for next time, I will exclude the safety car laps. That is a given that will have to happen. But again, at this point, time was progressing on further. Uni work was stacking up as well. And it had been a month, it had been two months. I can't remember exactly how long. And I was getting frustrated. I wanted to get this project finished. So I came up with version number six. Now, I don't have any uh, tables or anything like that for version number six, as I, 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 I don't know why I don't. But version number six was a mash of all previous five versions. It took different percentages from different versions. I created tables, I created questions and scored each, each version to determine what percentage I took from that one to create a new delta. It worked to some degree, but it still had the safety car issue. It still wasn't ideal and it just didn't work. And it was at that point that I took a break. I took about a week's break from this project as it just, it was going nowhere. I was making zilch in terms of progress. I was making zilch in terms of anything towards making a video. So I took a break. I took some thinking time. Uh, slept on it a couple of times because I do this thing where you, like you think about stuff before you go to bed and then you end up dreaming about, I don't know whether that's just me being weird But I end up dreaming about like ways to come around a problem and that's basically how I came up with version number seven So hello and welcome to the people that skipped uh, Versions number one to six if you have skipped and if you've jumped straight to here We are talking about version number seven and the version that I used in my algorithm. If you haven't listened to me speak about my safety car issue, which does apply to version number seven, just roll back just a little touch, uh, then you can listen to the safety car issue. If not, 
No worries, we'll begin with version number seven. So we start with a table that looks a bit like this. I've chosen Spa as this race result, as it's the race with the least amount of laps, so it's going to have the most clarity in terms of table. So this is their normal lap times. This was the official 2019 lap times for every single driver, lap after lap after lap. I've deleted every single lap for the people that retired and also chopped off the bottom couple of laps up until the last person finished. So far, it is very similar to all of the other algorithms. This is how it all started. The difference is I created this first table. Now what this table is, is the differential and the pace gap to the benchmark driver every single lap. So if we just look at that top row, you see that the clerk is actually zero. He is the benchmark. He was the fastest lap time on lap number one. Then Vettel to the left was 2.5 seconds behind. Then Bottas was 4.7 seconds behind Leclerc. And Hamilton was 3.4 seconds behind Leclerc. And then if we just go down a row, the zero's actually on Sergio Perez. So lap number two, Sergio Perez was the benchmark. And then I've worked out the difference for each driver behind Sergio Perez and rinse repeat for all 43 laps of Spa. So this table goes a whole lot deeper already than every single version of my algorithm previously. This creates a pace differential every single lap. And this is going to be the most in-depth way possible. Then I created a second table from all of this information. And it is important to note that the teammates are next to each other. And each teammate has the same delta time. The same differential to adjust the first table by. So these values in each of these columns is calculated by taking the smallest of the teammates gap. It has to be the smallest as that is therefore the quickest time that that car did the lap and the closest to the benchmark that that car is. So I take the smallest from the teammates, I times that by 0.75, I then add it to 25% of version number four, the qualifying pace, the outright pace differential between each team. So again, we're getting the benefits of version number four, the raw qualifying pace, and we're amalgamating it together with the race pace every single lap. 75% for race pace, 25% for qualifying pace. Now I can change those. I can make it 70-30, I can make it 60-40, I can make it 50-50, I can make it 80-20, I can make it whatever I like. It will change the results, it will. I feel that 75% bias towards race and 25% bias towards qualifying is a fairly decent amount because any more adjusting towards qualifying and we start skewing the results because there is such a big difference between race pace and qualifying pace. So the majority has to lie with race pace. And then I can create this table, table number four, the final table. And this was the table that I was pulling all of my data from to create the lap by lap data that you saw in the video. So this is subtracting that delta time from each driver's lap time as well. So if that didn't make sense, table number three, which took the smallest of the teammates delta times, multiplied it by 0.75, added it to 0.25 times the qualifying delta. It is then that number, that overall number from that long calculation that gets subtracted from each of the driver's lap times. So the two drivers per team have the same delta each lap, which changes every single lap as well. However, there is one important small little filter. It will only subtract the delta value from the table previous to the one that was just on the screen if it is less than 10. The only reason I've put that little filter in is to just sort of exclude any of the riffraff stuff that comes through. So I don't want to be, because no, no pace differential is 10 seconds. I don't want to be adjusting lap times by 10 seconds plus. That's just going to be ridiculous and going to cause all sorts of mess. I tried five, but I felt it was still not quite fair. So 10 was a decent sort of time for that. Again, if I change the filter, it's going to change the results. If I change the bias for the qualifying and the race pace, it changes the results. This is why it is such a, just a difficult task because I can change so many different things about it and we get so many different results, which is why I asked you in the video before it started not to take it too seriously as it can so very easily change. And there we are. That is version number seven. That is basically how it works. Lots of numbers, 
lots of deltas, and lots and lots of maths. It was a lot of effort, and it was a hell of a lot of fun to make this, and I know 100% that if the video is done well, it's doing actually quite well so far. It's only been a day since I've uploaded it, uh, and it's got about 50, 60 views. It's the number one video for the particular time frame since it's uploaded, which is a positive, which is a massive, massive positive. But 100% for the next method, I will be excluding the safety car lapse because it skews the data completely and buggers everything up. But if you have any of your own suggestions for improvements, for algorithm improvements or anything at all, videography improvements, script improvements, anything like that, please let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear your input on all of these algorithm versions on improvements that I can make to try and make this as, as, as accurate as possible because then that would be so cool to apply it to all previous seasons. Unfortunately, I can only go back to 2012 as all of the information I need for these algorithms is within the uh, FIA archives which only date back to 2012 which sucks because then I can't apply it to say 2000 or 2004 for example or 1988 or any of those years like that but hey ho we'll make do with what we have. But like I said, if you have any suggestions for any maths improvements, please let me know down in the comments below. I will be more than happy to listen to that. Hop in a Discord call, a Skype call or something like that. So I've got my Twitter as well, so feel free to DM me if you have any suggestions. My email is also in the description if you want to drop me a line as well. Thank you guys so much for watching and sitting through this long video as well. And I will catch you in the next video with whatever and whenever I decide to make it. I'll see you guys then.